Good morning. Welcome to worship on June 28th. Uh, we only really have one announcement for this week. We have uh, our last confirmation class is on Monday. And I uh, just want a, a shout out to these confirmands who have worked so hard this semester through uh, doing confirmation on Zoom. And they have just really engaged and learned so many things. We'll hold a live confirmation when we can, probably closer to the fall or in fall, early fall, and uh, we certainly look forward to that. Um, and uh, we have a task force meeting at five o'clock on Thursday. Welcome to worship. We're glad you're here. Please rise for the confession and absolution. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, now and forever, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God. We confess that we do not trust your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, redeem us. And in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in the newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance and divine mercy, of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The prayer of the day. God of grace, you have come to us through Jesus Christ so that we might have new life here on earth and with each other. Help us to surrender to your grace and completely change our life so that we might know you, your, know new strength in you. Let us love beyond frustrations so we might help and serve others as a witness to your power and grace. We pray this in the name of the risen Christ. Amen.
The first Bible reading comes from the book of Jeremiah, the 28th chapter, starting with the fifth verse. The prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back this place from Babylon, the vessels of the house of the Lord, and all the exiles. But listen now to the word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophet who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence from ancient from many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. The Psalm of the day comes from Psalm 89, starting with the first verse. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David. I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A God feared in the council of the holy ones, great and awesome above all those that are around. O Lord, God of hosts, who is as mighty as you, O God? Your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule the raging sea. When its waves rise, you still them. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Happy are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. They exalt in your name all day long and extol your righteousness, for you are the glory of their strength. By your favor, our horn is exalted, for our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, to the Holy One of Israel. The second reading comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, the sixth chapter, starting with the twelfth verse. Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God for those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Should we not sin or should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching for which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from these things from which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get 
is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Here ends the readings. Please stand as you're able. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the twelve, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of righteousness. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Gracious God, we thank you for your presence with us, even as we gather in diverse places. Please open our ears, our eyes, and our hearts, that we may hear and receive your word through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Peace. So many times in the past couple weeks, I have heard people talk of peace and how much they miss, well, peace. I have heard there is so much going on with COVID. Why must we have protests too? I have heard, I just wish the riots would stop. I have heard a prayer to go back to our peaceful lives. But was the past really all that peaceful for everyone? How do we reconcile pandemic illness and racial injustice and seek the path of Jesus, the path of peace? Our Old Testament reading today is from a troubled time, and it speaks to us now. We don't spend a lot of lectionary time in the book of Jeremiah, so a little background might be helpful. Jeremiah is considered one of the major prophets, living between the time of Isaiah and Ezekiel, and spanning the time when Judea fell to the Babylonians. Our story today takes place after the initial conquest of Judea. The Jewish king is wondering what's he to do, and two prophets say they have the answer from God. One prophet, Hananiah, tells the king to resist and fight against the Babylonians, bring back the stolen items and the people in exile from Babylon. Hananiah is telling the king what he wants to hear. God will be with them, and they can quickly regain their independence. Our text today picks up with Jeremiah, who says he so wishes that it was true, but the Babylonians, they are like a yoke around our neck. Jeremiah counsels, accept the situation as only peace will get them through their current circumstances. Two prophets, two different paths, resist, seek peace. But who really speaks for God? And how can we possibly know who the real prophet is? This division is not unlike the tension we feel today. People in the street protesting the treatment of black people in our society, and other people wanting the protest to end and things to go back to normal. We often find ourselves torn between emotions, and many of these situations are not simple. If we say black lives matter, does it mean that police lives don't matter? The death of George Floyd seems like a clear example of a black man's life not being valued. But then there are more complicated situations, like the recent death of Rashard Brooks in Atlanta. Mr. Brooks was shot while running from the police and aiming a taser towards one of the officers. Was deadly force against this black man necessary? That situation, it's more complicated. And what about the violence occurring in some of these protests? 
How can that further the cause of racial justice? These are conflicting emotions as we try to navigate this moment in history. It feels like, yes, but Yes, I support peaceful protest, but not rioting. Yes, I support the police, but sometimes black people are being killed unjustly. Can both prophets be right? Can we take action and have peace? Must we take action in order to have peace? At complicated times like these, I reflect back on the old phrase, what would Jesus do? What is the right answer as a Christian? So I want to put some context around the racial issues facing black people today. According to a 2019 report from the Gifford Law Center, in the United States, an unarmed black person is almost five times more likely to be shot and killed by police than an unarmed white person. And black people are 10 times more likely than white people to be killed by gun violence. While some of this difference in death is related to gang activity and police activity, there are also acts of unprovoked racial hatred, like the killing of Trayvon Martin, or more recently, Armand Aubrey, both young black men killed while walking or jogging, killed by white armed men, self-appointed community watch guards. This past week, we commemorated the fifth anniversary of the Manual 9 slaying in Charleston, members of a church, not so unlike ours, killed during Bible study by a white Lutheran man who wanted to start a race war. These injustices are real and they're not solitary. And it's not just disproportionate deaths. There are many more slights of racial injustice occurring daily. Just this week was a story of a black mother and her son who were refused service at a restaurant because the child was wearing athletic wear. At the same time, there was a white boy, dressed very similarly, eating on the patio. Only after being called out on social media with pictures of both boys did the restaurant apologize to the mother. It's been more than 55 years since the passage of the Civil Rights Act, and we still see these daily racial injustices. Now I know some of you may be questioning whether this is a conversation for the church. And I want to assure you that in the ELCA, justice for black Americans is an issue of the church. Both the ELCA and our Synod Bishop have put out statements on this issue, and I encourage you to read them. On the ELC web website, there was just launched an opportunity to sign the ELC Anti-Racism Pledge. I encourage you to go to the site, read it, and consider joining the over 2,300 other Lutherans that have already made a commitment to seek racial justice. Jesus' ministry was for all people, Jews, Gentiles, and even those reviled Samaritans. Jesus' love and grace knows no boundaries. He died for us all. For Jesus, all lives matter. Peaceful protest is the way that disenfranchised people have a voice to demand change from those that are in power. Even Jesus knew this. Jesus overturned the tables of the money changers in the temple, calling out the way that religious leaders sought to profit from access to the temple. Those that were poor, including many that followed Jesus, could not afford the temple tax to enter the temple. Such acts of civil disobedience got the attention of temple leaders in a way that ultimately brought about Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus was crucified for sedition, inciting people to rebel against the corrupt religious leadership and the injustices of Jesus' time. In today's society, peaceful protest, including speaking out against the unjust treatment of marginalized, those black lives that matter. Jesus would understand that. Jesus would understand that until black lives also matter, there is no way to achieve all lives matter. So how do we get to peace? That sense of calm that I hear is missing for so many people. 
In our text today, Jeremiah uses the Hebrew word shalom, meaning peace, harmony, wholeness, and tranquility. That sounds good, doesn't it? It is more than just peace. It is the peace of wholeness. How can our world be wholly at peace if some lives are not recognized and valued, if some people are not afforded the same dignity and respect of other people? Like Jeremiah, we are standing at a crossroad moment in history. If you want to have peace, you truly want shalom, the fulfillment of God's kingdom here on earth, then we must all stand with our black and brown and indigenous sisters and brothers and seek justice with them. We cannot go back to the old ways that maybe made us feel a little better, but fail to recognize the wholeness of peace for everyone. We can only march forward towards justice for all people, adding our voice to the call for change. This is the way of the true prophet, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's speak the words of our faith to the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please pray with me as we pray uh, prayers of intercession. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. God of all hope, we call on you today. We pray for those who are living in fear, fear of illness, fear for loved ones, fear of others' reactions to them. May your spirit give us a sense of calmness and peace. 
Lord, in your mercy. Loving God, we come as your children with sorrow in our hearts and lives which are confused and disturbed. These past months have brought death, pain, anguish, and distress to so many people. We are struggling to find peace and solace among the devastation, death, and hurt which has exploded in our nation. Lord, in your mercy. God of mercy, your grace is poured out for all. Inspire authorities, judges, and politicians to act with compassion. Teach us to overcome fear with hope, meet hate with love, and welcome one another as we would welcome you. Hear us, O oh God. Lord, in your mercy. Shepherding God, grant us the wisdom and faith to see that only in you our true love and joy ever found. Where we have wandered from your will, put us back on the path you would have us follow. Where we have bitterness and hate, give us love and consideration for others. And from the ashes of hate and destruction, may we rise up as a nation committed to your teachings and to your will and as a light to this world. This we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Lord, in your mercy. God of care, accompany all who are in deepest need. Comfort those who are sick, lonely, or abandoned, especially those we remember now out loud or in our hearts. Strengthen those who are weak or tired. Renew the spirits of all who call upon you. Lord, in your mercy. God of community, we give thanks for this congregation. We lift up church leaders who are inundated with information about new rules and regulations. Guide them with wisdom as they look to reopening. Bring peace to the hearts of the congregations as they embrace new ways of worship. Lord, in your mercy. Your Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the peace of the risen Christ be with you all and also with you. Uh, in a few moments, we are going to engage in Holy Communion. Um, but please take a moment to uh, wish those around you the peace of Christ and um, or take a moment of prayer during this time. Uh, to prepare for communion, please uh, have a piece of bread and a sip of wine uh, or juice ready, and uh, we'll begin in a few moments. The offering prayer. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours, and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Water and word, wine and bread, these are signs of your abundant grace. Nourish us through these gifts that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. To Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. You are indeed holy, O oh God, the fountain of all holiness. You bring light from darkness, life from death, speech from silence. We worship you for our lives and for the world you give us. We thank you for the new world to come and for the love that will rule all in all. In all this, we bless you for your only begotten Son, who fulfilled and will fulfill all your promises. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he gave it for all to drink, saying, 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, our God, with this bread and cup, we remember the incarnation of your Son, his human birth, and the covenant he made with us. We remember the sacrifice of his life, his eating with outcasts and sinners, his acceptance of death. But chiefly on this day, we remember his rising from the tomb, his ascension to the seat of power, and his sending of the holy and life-giving Spirit. We cry out for the resurrection in our lives when Christ will come again in beauty and power to share with us this great and promised feast. Let us speak now the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we come to the table today, we come during times of a troubled world. We come during the times of a pandemic. We come during the times of confusion, of protests, and what to think and what not to think. There's so much in there. We also come during a time of crisis in our own lives, trying to wade through the trauma and the grief. We come through times also where the sun is coming out a little bit brighter than it was a few days ago. Summer is here. It's a new season. This is a new opportunity to embrace life, maybe even though it's different but to embrace life in a way that starts to lift our spirits. How do we do that? I don't know. But I know that Jesus is with us. And here at this table, Jesus will come to you and be with you as you take the wine and the bread, the body and blood of Christ. Jesus is there with you. And whatever prayers that are too deep for words, give them to him now. Let him be a part of those prayers and open your heart. Your prayers are received. And even if you don't have those words to say, Jesus hears them in your silence. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. God of the welcome table, in this meal we have feasted on your goodness and have been united by your presence among us. Empower us to go forth sustained by these gifts so that we may share your neighborly love with all through Jesus Christ, the giver of abundant life. Amen. Receive the benediction. God Almighty, send your light and truth to keep us all the days of your, our lives. The hand of God protect you. God's holy angels accompany you. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit cause grace to be mighty upon you. Amen. <laughs>